preload the preload live. Man, what's going on, everybody? My name is Pete Cabrera Jr. with Royal Family International University School of Identity and Lifestyle. Man, I want to thank you guys for jumping on board. And I'm super excited. So we're going to wait for some other people to jump on right now. We have 156 and it's climbing. So we're all running around trying to get everything ready for you guys. We're super excited. This is the first time that we've actually done this. So I'm super excited about it. And uh, you guys get to be our first ones that we're actually going to do it with. So I find it very, 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 very intriguing when it comes to the things of God. So, guys, we got a lot of things to cover and we won't have at it. So I'm hoping that we can get started. So we're going to start right here. So hopefully my icon is not too small. Let's get a little bit bigger. Oh, yeah, I like that. I like that. So, guys, we got 171 people in the room. We're going to hit some stuff today. So, if you're like me and you like to get in your word, I want to start off with a little bit of prayer, if you guys don't mind, and then we're going to get into the word. But until then, we're still waiting for people to jump on. But I just want to get started because I know we got a lot of ground to cover. And towards the, the uh, webinar, I'm going to be talking about some things towards the end. Um, you get a PDF at the end of this that can, you can actually download it and you can go through the actual webinar again and you can go through it with your printout and go through it if you want to take your time. If you're like me, I like to be very thorough and uh, it'll give you the opportunity to go through it again. So there'll be a replay and so you can play it back as many times as you want. And that replay will be sent to your email, which is a totally different link. It won't be this link. It'll be a new link and then we'll jump on and we'll go from there. So guys, as you can tell, we have the School of Identity and Lifestyle logo there on the side. Uh, I am with Royal Family International and we're Royal Family Media LLC as well. And we're going to get started. So I'm just going to go ahead and start praying if you don't mind. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for everyone who took time aside to be a part of this amazing webinar, Lord God, because it's about who you are and who you are through us, Lord God. We want to give you our best in everything that we do. And so, Father, I thank you that I am not the teacher. I'm the administrator of your word. I know the word says that you raise up teachers, but I want to honor you today, Lord God, by giving you the opportunity to be a teacher to me and to use your word through me, Lord God, to reach people from all around the world. So I just thank you for that, Lord God. So, guys, in the name of Jesus, let's get started, right? So, we're going to talk about Genesis 1, but before we do that, we're going to be reading our words based on the two perspectives. And what I have here is reading your Bible from the right perspective. Now, you're probably saying, you know, what's the difference between the way I read it now and how I read it later on? Well, it's very interesting because the Bible was written by Hebrews. I don't know if you know that or not. Written by a Hebrew author. Written to a Hebrew audience. Written to a Hebrew culture. Read into a Hebrew mindset. Now you're probably saying, you know, what's the difference between a Hebrew mindset and a Western mindset? Well, here it is. Eastern perspective versus Western perspective. And I went ahead and wrote it there if you want to read along. The issue we have as born again believers is that we read the Bible from a Western perspective. We must consider the culture and the times in which the Bible was written. And yet, yes, the Bible has an agenda. Now you might say, uh, why do you say an agenda? Well, uh, the Bible's trying to get you somewhere. It's trying to get you to Christ. So yes, it has an agenda and it's constantly pointing you in the right direction. And that direction is to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So yes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are also written with an agenda, written to different people, different audience, different genres, whether it be Romans, whether it be Greek, whether it be the forgotten, whether it be the one who's, who's there in the law and the one who's outside the law. So it's all written to everyone according to the letters that are written. So yes, there's an agenda and myself, I also have an agenda, and my agenda is to get you to the same place that the Bible's trying to get you 
and that's to Christ. The agenda is to reveal God's purpose and plan for our lives. We have many instances in the Bible where we think we know what is being said and we totally miss what God was telling us because of our lack of understanding in Western lenses. All right? Guys, I have a lot, a lot of slides, so bear with me. I love to talk I'm long because I like to be done. Eastern mindset versus Western mindset. Narrative versus data. Information versus relationship. Two separate styles of learning and teaching. Let's explore these two perspectives. Now, there's a reason why I'm talking about this. Because when you get into the Word of God, you're going to see it from two different perspectives. So let's talk about the room perspective. Okay, and as you can tell, you got some people looking in the room here. Um, let me show you this one. The same view here. So there's some people that look into a room, whether it be the Word of God or perspective, with the same lens for 15 to 30 years. So let's say that uh, you're looking into a house and there's one window that you're looking in through. And you've been looking in through this window for 15 to 30 years and you notice everything in the room. You can tell me everything about this room from that perspective. So you've been looking in that room for 30 years and I come over and I say, hey, I noticed you've been looking into this room from this window and you're like, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And I say, hey, you wanna know something? There's a window right over here that you haven't looked into that room from. And they'd say, um, and you'd say, what are, what are you talking about? And I said, have you, have you looked at the room from this perspective? And so I take you by the hand, I take you to this window and you're like, whoa, the room hasn't changed, but it's unfolding. I'm seeing more of the room, right? And so you look at that, you, you look at that perspective, you're looking at the room from that perspective for another year or two. And then I'll come back and say, hey, let me show you this other window. And you're like, wait a minute, there's another window? And you're like, yeah, it's another window. So then I take you to that window and then you look in and then, so now you see more of the room, not that the room has changed, but that it's, it's expanding in your understanding of what, what, what is going on in the room. And so then I take you to another room and then another room and another room, or excuse me, another window, excuse me. And so I take you to each window and you're like, wow, here I was looking into this room from one window, one perspective, and you come in and you're showing me all these different perspectives, all these different views, all these different angles. And now I'm looking at the word from all these other angles. And I'm like, wow, there's so much of this room that I didn't embrace the first time. And what's amazing about this is that's the word of God. God has given us his word and we're to look at it from every perspective, from every angle, we're to our God, to wrestle, to struggle, to, when I say struggle, we, we struggle with certain understandings and belief systems because truth hurts sometimes. And God is always trying to reveal truth to us, right? So now, with that in mind, now we got many rooms, right? And this is the word of God. The word of God has many rooms, right? Many, many, many things you can walk in, many things that, that he wants to reveal to you. But here's the problem. A lot of us want to go into these rooms, but we're just looking in through one window, one perspective. And this is crazy. Because we as Westerners don't understand this. The Westerner wants to know who built the room. The Easterner wants to know who lived in the room. These are two different perspectives, okay? For instance, now that we understand two perspectives, we can explore God's word. But before we do that, let me give it to you like this. If I want to say to you, hey, that's a, and this is funny because there's a cat on here. I should have used the dog. If I was to tell you this, hey, um, that's a good dog. If you're a Westerner, you say, well, that's a dog who's obedient. That's a dog who listens. That's a dog who just does as he's told. Man, he's an obedient. That's a good dog. And that's what you would get. But if you were out in the East, if you were out where we were in India, and you were to say, hey, that's a good dog, that's a totally different conversation. Because when you hear, hey, that's a good dog in India? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Someone show me something. Okay. Cool. Sorry about that. It's a totally different perspective because um, people eat dogs in the East. So these are two different things, two th different, different mindsets that are going on when you talk about this. So in the same way, when we read our word, there's some things that God is saying to us. Now, remember, because it was written by a Hebrew author, 
to a Hebrew audience and a Hebrew mindset, there's some things that we're not understanding. And that's what I'm going to break down to you today. I'm going to break down to you some things biblically from the mindset of which the Bible was written. Now, a lot of us will be told, hey, you know, the Bible was written to me. And yes, it was written to you as a non-believer coming to Christ, but it was written to an audience that understood the culture of the Hebrew people at the time. And so it wasn't written to you directly as, hey, you know, I'm going to write it to an Easterner or a Westerner. I'm writing it to an Easterner. And with this perspective, we're going to dig into it. So an Easterner would say, you know, I want to know about the curtains in the room. I want to know about the color in the room. I want to know who lived in the room. Like, who is in this room? And the Easterner would say, you know, who built the room? How many square footage is it? And so these are two different mindsets. So the Easterner grows his, 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 his understanding, excuse me, of, of truth expands, right? And to a Westerner, it's like ultimate truth. So if you were a Westerner and you got truth, you would defend that truth. And if you found out that your truth was off a little bit, you would shift your truth to line up to your understanding. You would not change your perspective in any way. You would just defend that truth, even if you were wrong, because that's the mindset that we have. We have this mindset of, I have ultimate truth, and I'm going to back this truth up, and I'll carry this truth to the grave, even if I'm wrong. And Easterner says, well, you know what? I understand that truth is unfolding, and it has a root. And it's expanding, and it's growing, and it's growing, and it's growing. Kind of like when you look into the room. You look into the room. And the room's expanding. And that's the word of God. The word of God's expanding. But the root is always the same, and the root is Christ. So if anything takes you out of Christ or moves you away from Christ, that is not the root, right? That's the reason we have all these issues. Um, the reason I'm talking about this is because once we go a little bit deeper, I'm going to break some things down biblically for you. And uh, it's going to kind of trick your mind a little bit, but I'm going to show you biblically why it does that. And this is one of the main reasons why I started writing the curriculum that I'm writing. Um, so yeah, so guys, I would like for you to get your Bibles, right? We have 246 people on right now. This is amazing. But if you have your Bibles, I need you to get them because you got to get in your word. This isn't just Pete talking to you. You have to learn how to uh, how to get in your word. You got to learn how to break down scriptures. You got to learn how to find, find out what it is that God has given you. I cannot give you truth because truth is a person. I can present truth to you. I can say, hey, this is Jesus. This is his word. But at the end of the day, you're the one that has to embrace that truth, right? <clears throat> so I was asked about the Back to Basics book. I threw it in here to let you guys know. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but I didn't learn how to read till I was 28. I learned how to read in rehab through the Holy Spirit. It was very interesting. It took me two years to write this, and I put this out there because uh, and what I'm talking about, the Back to Basics, takes you back to everything that, that leads you to Christ, back to the, to the core of of your walk. And I want to throw this on there because we actually have a free chapter that comes with it, but I wanted to give this to you guys, the free chapter, and you can download that later on, but that's the back to basics books that I want to throw in here. I'm saying all this while you're getting your Bible. So it gives you something to think about while you're digging. I don't know if your Bible's in front of you. I don't know if you came um, prepared. Some people don't even use Bibles. They use their, 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 uh, their phones. So I'm just like putting this out there for you, right? So let's get started. Damn. Oh, man. Genesis 1. Look, guys. I know a lot of you have uh, read Genesis 1. But I'm going to show you something you probably never even gave much thought about. Right? So, uh, yeah. Genesis 1. 1. In the beginning. And I know I wrote it up here, but I still want you to get in your word. Because it's important that you get in your word. Genesis 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Oh, man, Lord, please help me when it comes to this. <laughs> what is heaven and earth? Give that some thought. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. In some translations, it says the heaven and the earth. And this is really funny because I was talking to my good friend, Pastor Dale, today. And I said, hey, what did God create first? And the first thing he said was, God created the light. I said, no, he didn't. He didn't create the light first. And he said, yeah, he did. I said, really? I said, give that some thought. 
So we sat there and I said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is what you see when you hear it or read heaven and earth. This is what you see. This is what you see when you hear or read heaven and the earth. And to a Westerner, you'd be correct because heaven and earth is like, you know, that's the heaven and that's the earth and God created it. But to a Easterner, that's what you see. This is what an Easterner sees when he hears heaven and earth. That's very interesting. And I'm going to show you biblically why that is. It means both and. So you'd say, Pete, what are you saying? That when he created the heavens and the earth, he meant a temple, not heaven and earth? I say, yeah, he was creating a temple. And then you say, wait a minute. But there was no temple. It was heaven and earth. And then you say, yeah, heaven and earth. Uh, so how does this how does this line up to the temple? Because the temple is what has the light. The temple is where God lives. The temple is where he resides, right? And I'm going to show this to you biblically. So God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because he needed to say, let there be light. So where's light at? It's what sustains heaven and earth. Let me show it to you. Psalm 78, 69. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he was established forever. Acts 17, 24. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Isaiah 65, 17 through 18. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. Here it is. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But ye be glad and rejoice forever in that which I created. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now, this is talking about Jerusalem, right? John 2.19. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rise it up. Okay, this is very interesting. Because this says that Jesus is the temple, and inside the temple is the spirit. Is this correct? <laughs> okay, watch this. Hey, ask yourself this. Ask yourself, what does this mean? You ready? Okay, hold on to your britches. Revelation is 21.1. <laughs> and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Okay. You know how many times we've read this verse? You know how many times I've heard believers quote this verse, talking about, hey, man, here's what's going to happen. The earth is going to be gone, and the heaven is going to be gone, and then there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven, but there ain't going to be no water. There ain't going to be no sea. Can you imagine no sea? And I was always scratching my head, like, why were they saying that there'd be no more sea? Once again, Westerner perspective, Easterner perspective, they already understand what heaven and earth means. Let me show it to you. Bam. This is Solomon's temple. And if you notice, the inside of the temple is made of gold. And the presence of God filled the temple, right? Why did it fill the temple? Because it's God's presence. And God's presence is always in a temple. What I mean by that is when he said he created the heavens and the earth, he was creating a place to reside, a place for the light to reside. It's always about the light residing somewhere. I'm going to show this to you biblically. So there's this amazing thing. You're probably asking yourself, what, what is the sea? What, what's that mean? That's the sea right there, right? Let me show you before. This thing at the bottom, it looks like a big old hot tub <laughs> with a bunch of oxens around it. That's called the sea. Now, the reason it is called the sea was because you had to wash yourself 
before you went into the temple because you had to clean yourself, right? A lot of people don't know that. Now, here's what's really going to mess you up. That right there. See how it says heaven and earth? That's crazy. The reason that there will be no more sea is because you'll be clean. You'll be clean. So when he says that heaven and earth, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, what is he talking about? He's talking about the new temple. The new temple. And the new temple is you. And the reason there's no more sea is because you've been made clean. So this is what's very interesting. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1, God is talking about he created the heavens and the earth. And then he said, let there be light. So now there was a light. And who's the light, guys? The Bible says that God is light and there's no darkness at all. And we know that Jesus is the light. And I'm going to talk about this when we talk about Genesis, when we talk about creation, because we're going to talk about that. But God had created man and God created man to be in his presence right now if if heaven and earth is God's temple if heaven and earth is his place where he resides if heaven and earth is where he dwells and he puts man in heaven and earth with him this means we're in communion with God and what I find very interesting is that God gave man dominion over heaven and earth it's very interesting he gave him dominion over all things and then you hear about Christ later on, that he was given power and authority, whether it be things in heaven or on earth, right? And why is that? That's because he is the light. He's the light. So I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go a little deeper here, but before I do that, um, guys, some of the teachings that I'm putting out, they're right here on the site. This is on-demand video that you can go on. And the reason that I put this on here is because when I get done with this, some of the teachings I'm going to do more in depth on this because I only have so much that I can teach on this on this webinar. And if you know me, I get into three or four hour teachings and I know a lot of people don't have that kind of time. So what we do is we put the teachings on the on demand site, which will be on the side and you can go there at any time. And the reason we did this was because I had a lot of alumni that came through the school and they were like, hey, we want to sew into you monthly. And I say, I got a better idea. How about we do this site? We put the teachings on it. This way, instead of just sewing into us monthly, you get teachings all the time. This way, you put in, we put out, and we work together. So there'll be more information on that. If you want to know about that, it should be up there. So here we go. Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Who or what is the light? Man, I got a whole teaching on this. John 8, 12. Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Man, I find that very interesting because the Bible says that your life is hidden in Christ. Right? So really what this means is if you're not born again, you're living in darkness. So either you live in darkness or you live in the light. That's it. These are the two natures. These are the two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. So when we say, hey, who is the light? God is light. And just in case you're wondering, Revelation 21, 23 says, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the lamb is the light thereof. Man, that's heavy. That means that you don't need a moon or a sun because Jesus is the light. We're going to get into that here in a little bit. We can all agree that Jesus is the light and the light of the world and that God is the light. First John 1, 5. This then is the message which you have heard of him and declared unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You know, I had a brother in Christ ask me this. If God is light, why did he create darkness? I said, just because he created it doesn't mean he is it. <laughs> Very interesting. We can confirm that Genesis begins with God creating a place, the heavens and the earth, that light would dwell and sustain. Matthew 5, 15. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but under a lampstand and give it light until the whole house. So basically, 
Jesus is the light that comes into your house and it lights up everything because it used to be darkness. So this is what creation is all about. Let me go a little further. All of creation was God's house in Genesis 1, Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Man, that's a heavy thought. Okay, man, now let's get into the teaching. So the reason that I asked you about the temple Whenever God said he created the heavens and the earth, we know that the Jewish traditions and, and the Jewish rabbis, they understand that the temple is heaven and earth. And, and I'm going to show that to you as we go down. The temple represented God's presence. And we know that heaven is God's presence. Because look, without God's presence, it's not heaven. It's just Disneyland. You guys know that, right? So God's presence makes it heaven. In his presence is fullness of joy. So his presence is heaven, right? And it's pretty interesting because now we live in Christ. Now we live in his presence. We live in joy. We're in that, right? And what I find very interesting is that when you see the temple, wherever the dirt is, that's called earth. Behind the veil, that's called heaven because that's where the presence of God is. And the veil is what keeps you from understanding and having that under understanding with God, which basically separates you. It's the flesh that separates you. That's why Jesus came to separate you from the flesh, which is the veil, that Jesus is the veil, right? And so the veil was torn, which means that when the veil was torn, that now we become one in that temple. But in that temple, because of fallen man, because of sin, man cannot be one with God. The light could not dwell in him because of sin. And so after Christ dies and the resurrection, now your heart can cry out of a father and now the light, because sin was dealt with and paid for, can now dwell inside you, which is the Christ in you, right? Here we go. So we're going to read Genesis 1. Hey, guys, try and find the red flags, okay? We're going to have at it. But just try to run, find the red flags. Now, what I mean by this is things that that will chime in and you'll be like, um, that sounds a little off. That sounds a little weird. And I know, guys, that a lot of us read our Bibles and we kind of just read over things because we try to read our Bible in a year. And I know when you when you try to read your Bible in a year, you just kind of feels like you're pulling teeth and you're kind of just trying to get through the chapter because you kind of want to get done. And you want to kind of keep going. And you're just like, man, I'm just trying to get through it. I don't read my Bible like that. I take my time. I'm like, OK, Lord, this is your word. I want the sustenance. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to dine. I'm going to enjoy your word. I'm going to really, really, really give this some thought. What you're saying. Why you're saying it. What are you trying to show me? What is it that you're saying to me? Come on. Give it to me. I want it. I want everything you have. Come on. I want everything. I want, I, I want everything. I want the steak. I want the potatoes. I want the corn. I want the bread. I want the butter. I want everything. I want dessert. I want, I want everything you have. Right? That's kind of how I read my Bible. So here you go. We're going to read Genesis 1 through 31. Okay. In the beginning, now remember, your job is to find the red flags, right? Because God buries truth in his word. He buries it, which means that you have to look for it. Search, knock, dig, do everything in your power to pull from it, right? That's the word haga. Haga means... Um, Aga is a word that uh, that rabbis use, right? It means to meditate, but the word haga does not mean meditate. It means something else, but they use the word haga in place of the word meditate. Aga is what a lion does whenever it's eating. So when it traps a gazelle and it, it's got his, his teeth on his throat and it's about to eat it, it's called haga. It growls. It protects its meal as it's eating it. It's saying, back up. This is mine. You're not going to take this from me. That's the word haga, meditate. So God gives you the word so you can meditate on it day and night, defending what it is that God has given you and at the same time getting all the nutrients from it, not allowing anyone to take anything from you that God is trying to give you. That's what all that's about. So in Genesis 1, we're going to go. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. In the evening and the morning was the first day. It's one day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning was the second day. And God said, I love it when he says God said. Look, guys. This is what I love about God. When God says something, something's going to happen. We serve a God that spoke in the darkness. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. God is the type of God. He's so His word is so powerful that he can yell out to nothing. Like he can say, hey, nothing. And nothing would literally turn around and say, yes, Lord. That's how powerful God's word is. God's word doesn't come back void because whenever he throws it, if there's nothing that that word's going to hit, that word will create something to bounce off of. That's how powerful God's word is. That's why you let your yeses be yeses and your noes be no, right? And God said, let the waters under the wa under the heavens be gathered together under one place and let the dark land appear and it was so. The dry land appear and it was so. And God called the dry land earth. Okay, so what did he call earth? the dry land. What do we call earth? This globe. No, earth is dry land. You'll say, no, earth is a planet. Earth, no, earth is dry land. And he gathered together of the waters called he the seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, <laughs> let the earth bring forth. Man, the earth is bringing forth the grass. Hey, do you? Anyways, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. The herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass. See how the earth is bringing forth grass. An herb yielding seed after its own kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its own kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning was the third day. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be a signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light unto the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night. To divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning was the fourth day. Remember, you're looking for red flags. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures. Hey, what brought forth? The waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that had life and fowl that may fly above the earth and open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moved, which the waters brought forth. This is crazy. This is saying that the water brought forth something and God made life out of it. What the water brought forth. That's very interesting, right? After their own kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning was the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after its kind, cattle, and creepeth thing, and the beasts of the earth after its kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind. And everything that creeped upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. I love, see, this is very interesting. The reason that it says in the image of God created he him, male and female, because Adam, hear me out, this is, this is so heavy. When Adam was created, Eve was already there. Eve was already in Adam. Eve came from Adam. So when he said, hey, let us create man in our image, male and female, female came, female came out of Adam. When Adam was created, Eve was already there. He was in Adam. It's crazy, right? This, this is so crazy because people take that and twist that up. And God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have been given, I've given you herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you shall it be meat, meaning food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there's life. I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was the sixth day. Man. Genesis 21, 1 through 3. And we're going to stop after this. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, which is kind of interesting because how do you rest when you're God, right? Was he tired? And he's like, you know, that was a lot of work, man. I, I got to rest, man, because, man, just creating stuff just by talking is so tiring. I mean, like, I'm so tired, right? And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested. That in it, because that in it, he had rested from all his works which God had made. All right, first red flag. <clears throat> Before I get into this, give this some thought. The Bible says that God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. The Bible says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So when God created man, there was no darkness in him at all. In fact, I believe that he had the light. And if you were to say, no, I don't believe he had the light, well, then how did he fall into darkness if he didn't have the light? And I believe that Jesus is the light of men. It says that Jesus is the light of men. So I am to assume that, uh, that, that Adam was created without the light, without the spirit, without Christ, without. It just makes no sense for me because obviously they weren't born in the darkness. They fell in the darkness. Right? But anyway, let's get into that red flag. Ready? Here we go. First red flag. Why do the day start off with the evening and the morning? Day one, the evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. The evening and the morning was the third day. I thought the day started off the morning and the evening was how the day started. What is going on here? Why is it starting off the evening and the morning? And I'm going to tell you why that is. That's because God always starts the day with rest because he is your rest. Now, the God of this world will tell you that you start off in the morning with work. But to God's creation, you start off with rest in the evening. You go to sleep and that's when your day starts. You start off with rest. That's very, very interesting. But here's where it gets really, really exciting right here. Second red flag. Day one, Genesis 1, 4 and 5. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. Question number one. Day one, we have day and night. Correct? So we have day and night on day one. Second question. This means we have an evening and a morning. 
Because how can you have a day without a morning? And how can you have an evening without a night? That's very interesting to me. Let me tell you why. How can we count the first three days without a moon and a sun? Genesis 1.16. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day. The lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven. To give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night. And to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. This is on the fourth day guys. He says to rule over the day. And rule over the night. And to divide the light. From the darkness. This is very interesting. Because in Genesis chapter 1, 4. And God saw the light. That it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Okay. In Genesis 1, 4. It says that God divided the light from the darkness. But in Genesis 1, 18. Four days later. And to rule over the day and over the night. To divide the light from the darkness. This is very interesting to me. So this is telling me that on day one, he divided the light from the darkness. But the sun and the moon weren't created to day four. So watch, I'll read 116. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day. So it made the day. The sun made the day. And the lesser light to rule the night. So it was there for the night. Moon made the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven. Why did he set them there? To give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night. And to divide the light from the darkness. So he created the moon and the sun to divide the light from the darkness. That was four days after the fact Three there or four days ago where it says, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So how did he divide the light from the darkness? Is in four days later, the sun and the moon were created to divide the light from the darkness. And to rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. First red flag. Bam. Day one. Watch this. God divided the light from the darkness. I, I wrote it down right here, and I'm actually going to show you what that looks like. So you have light on one side, dark on the other. Day two, God made the firmament, the sky, and the sea. I kind of just put this out here for you so you can see what it looked like. Day three, whose seed is in itself? Land, grass, seed, and fruit. Day four. <laughs> okay, wait. God set the stars, the sun, the moon, and the firmament on day four. Okay, hold on. Let me go back here. How did these seeds and grass and fruit grow without a sun? <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay. It's called seasons, right? Land has to have grass and seed and fruit and has to grow, right? This is interesting. Now, you'll say, well, that's supernatural. That's because, you know, because it's God and God could do whatever he wants, but God set it to motion the way things were going to go, right? So day four, we have uh, the stars, the sun, the moon, and the firmament. Look, hear me out. We know that there's a tide. The sun creates a tide, right? Was there no tide here? <laughs> so day one, light and darkness. Okay, so how do we divide the light from the darkness? Was there like a gray area? Was it, so what? Okay, like in this room, right? If there's light in here, where, where's the dark? How do you divide the darkness? Do you put a wall up? What do you do? Do you, do you cover the light? Like how? Okay, anyways, here we go. 
Day two, sky and sea. Day three, seeds. Wow. Day four, sun, moon, stars. Day five, every living creature that moved. Birds, whales. Cool. Six, I didn't write nothing there. Um, somebody said, hey, you should write something there. I'm like, eh, no, I'm, I'm, I think it kind of speaks for itself. Day six, animals, man, herbs, trees. Day seven, hey, he rested from all the work that he had made. Red flag. Oh, why, why is that a red flag? The seven day doesn't end with the evening or morning. So how do you know when it ends? You guys know that, right? Here, let me read it to you because I have it right here. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all hosted them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all the work which God created and made. And that's it. That's all he says about the Sabbath. So on day one, it says in the evening, morning was the first day. In the evening and the morning was the second day. In the evening and the morning was the third day. In the evening and the morning was the fourth day. In the evening and the morning was the fifth day. In the evening and the morning was the sixth day. What happened? What happened to the evening and the morning on the seventh day? What happened to that, God? Okay. I just showed you some things that if you didn't take your time, right? And if you didn't like really listen and go through it, go through your scriptures, you'll find out that, hey, wait a minute, this, this makes no sense. How is it that the sun and the moon are made on the fourth day? How did you know there were days? Because it says that the moon and the sun were made to count days. That's what it says. So it says the first, first day. Okay, so when do we know the first day was over? If the sun and the moon didn't rotate, if it didn't do 24 hours, it wasn't a day, right? So how do we know it was a day? And who is he telling that it was a day? Because the sun and the moon given for seasons and days and years, and so we know the day. So how do we know it was evening? And how do we know it was day if the sun determines when it's morning and the, and the moon determines when it's evening? So how did they know that the evening and the morning was the first day if there was no sun to determine the day and no moon to determine the evening? Day one, bam. Okay, that's kind of crazy. But there's the light. Okay, so the light's there. But if there's light and no evening, so how, do, wait, how's this? This makes no sense. So then day two, same thing. The evening in the morning was the second day. Okay, so we have two days now. So who's counting the days and how do we know their days? Oh, we know because it's evening and morning. Okay, so how do you have an evening without a sun or without a moon? And how do you have a morning without a sun rising? Like, this is confusing. Day three. Okay, cool. Another day. Wait, another day? How do we know it's another day? Oh, because it says in the evening and the more more. Okay, how many mornings have we had now? We've had three mornings. Okay, so how do, you, how, do, how do you know it's morning? Oh, the sunrise. Wait, wait. But the sun wasn't created to the fourth day. So what was rising? Then you'd say, well, Jesus was rising every morning. That, that's not what it says, right? Jesus doesn't determine the days. The sun and the moon does. So now we have a dilemma. Why is this happening? What's happening, right? So then... The seventh day. Now, all of a sudden, there isn't an evening in the morning. Okay, wouldn't it make more sense that the seventh day, that they be, you know, one long Sabbath day until the fourth day, but actually the fourth day would be the first day because it'd be the evening in the morning was the fourth day, but it'd be the first day. But yet the seventh day, how do you even know it's a day? It says the seventh day, but how would you know when that day ends? Or it would be the setting of the sun. Okay. But it doesn't say that. It didn't say in the evening and the morning was the Sabbath day. Huh. Very interesting.
Genesis 1 falls. It's three days and seven days and one day, right? This is the way God wrote Genesis chapter 1. It's called a chasm, right? So what ends up happening here, and I wrote it down for you so you can understand this. Day one and day four are the same day because he said, oh, let me go back, because he said that he had created, that he had separated the dark from the light, right? That's what it says. And so in a way, he created the stars, the sun, and the moon. So it only makes sense that it's the same day because the same day that he separated the light from the darkness is the same day that he created the stars, the sun, and the moon. And that's how he separated them. But then you say, well, that, that kind of makes sense, but why would it do that? Well, well, day two is the same as day five because what he did is he created the sky. He separated the sky from the sea. And then he put birds and whales on the same day, right? You'd say, well, why would you say that, Pete? Well, in order for there to be grass and seeds and fruit, there has to be a sun. What, he created the, 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 the sky and the sea with birds and whales, right? Without birds and whales, wouldn't it make sense that the sea brought forth? The sea brought forth. That's why I was showing you that the sea brought forth animals. They brought forth. When he created them, that's what they did. They brought forth, right? And so day one is the same as day four. Day two is the same as day three. They fold. That's what the seventh day is. The seventh day is a chasm that shows you that, hey, this story folds, right? But what does it fold on? That's the question you got to ask yourself. What does it fold on? Day three is land, grass, seed, and fruit, animals, man, herbs, and tree. So my question is, why is God writing it in this way? Why does he want you to see the seven days, the three days, and the one day? That's the question you got to ask yourself. Well, I find that very interesting. Because the seventh day is the day of rest, right? And the day of rest in Hebrews chapter 4, 9 through 11, there remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example belief. So my question is, what is the day of rest? What is that? Jesus is our day of rest. Jesus is our rest that our Father was screaming out to us from creation. More or less, creation was screaming out. So this is very interesting because when you read Genesis, from the beginning, he wants you to know that he created the heaven in the earth, which he's saying, I'm created a temple, a temple, right? And the world is his temple where he resides, right? God can be anywhere he wants, but this is the way he wanted to do it. He wanted to tell creation that, look, I'm creating a place and I'm going to dwell there, right? This is very interesting. In the same way, Jesus was also the temple and he also dwelled there, right? This is very interesting. So God created a place so he could dwell. And in that place, he put us there. And then when man fell, we no longer could have communion with God in that relationship. So now, instead of us being in the temple, he put the light in us and made us a temple. And this is what Genesis is trying to tell you with the three days. Because you could be the person who lives in the seven days. So I got seven days to figure it out. I'm just living life every day. I didn't even know about the Sabbath. I was just living Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. It's just every day for me. Let's do it again. And let's do it again. And you never find that day of rest, right? And then there are those that find Christ. And they just live based on the three days. There's like Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. And you'll stay there for a long time trying to figure out, you know, hey, Jesus' birth, his death, and his resurrection. And you'll labor in that all day long. You try to figure it out. What's going on? I want to know about Christ. I want to know about what he's done. And then you get to the place where you go into his rest. Which is the Sabbath. Right? Check this out. The third day. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. 
So when you go to Genesis 1 and you read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Did you know that Jesus came to separate you from the darkness? Jesus came to separate you from flesh and spirit. That's what the light does. That's what the sword does. That's what the word does. It cuts you. It separates you. And that's what the light does. When the light comes, the darkness is gone. It separates the dark from the light. And these are the two kingdoms. And God breaks it down. In Genesis chapter 1, the authors are trying to show you. In Genesis chapter 1, what is going on and what the Bible is trying to reveal to you. It's trying to reveal to you that there's two kingdoms. There's the dark and there's the light. There's the temple and the light in the temple. And when you're not under that, you can read the word and find out that God sent Jesus as a temple. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it. And they're scratching their heads like, this guy's going to destroy what took hundreds of years? And he's going to raise it in three days? He's like, no, that is not what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about right there. The Christ, the light now lives in us, the new temple here on earth. Spirit, soul, and body. That is how we were created. The holies of holies is the spirit, the inner court, the soul, the outer court, the body. You are a temple of the living God. And God created the temple from the beginning of time to show you that, look, what is in the spiritual, it's also in the physical. Look, he's trying to show you both sides. Now, you could say, you know, it's either or. No, it's both and. That's what I love about God. He's like, look, it could be this, it could be that. What do you think it is? And, and the reason I do these seminars is because I'm asking you, what do you think it is? Do you think that the new heaven and earth is, is a new place? Or do you think you're new now and the light dwells in you? What does that even mean? Are we waiting for a new earth, a, a new heaven? A new, we're new creations. Does a new creation live in the old or does it live in the new? The Bible says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Yet, Jesus came wrapped in flesh, and he had blood, and he walked as an inheritance all day long, and yet he was glorified, and he went to the Father so we could live in Christ. So now, this is what's very interesting. Now that we're in Christ, are we the new heaven and earth, or are we to bring the new heaven and earth, or are we going to heaven? Like, what is going on here, right? So I'm not saying that heaven is in the place. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is heaven is where God resides. And we are in God's presence right now. We are in God's presence. So that means that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. So if Christ is in us and we're the new temple, then that means that we have heaven on the inside of us. Not that it's not a place. I'm not saying it's Either or, I'm saying it's both and, because it also says, as he is, so are you in this world, that we're seated in heavenly places. But yet, I'm seated right here in Kansas. What's going on? I'm sitting in Kansas, and I'm sitting in heavenly places? That makes no sense. What well, does make sense if you understand how God writes his word, if you understand how he buries truth, and he has he has the Holy Spirit training us and teaching us and guiding us into all truth. And when we get in our word, when you read Genesis 1, I want you to read it for yourself. I want you to go through it and say, I know, you know, God, what are you trying to show me in this? What, you created the, the heavens and the earth? Yeah. He's always created the heavens and the earth. There always had to be a heaven and earth. There always had to be a temple. There always had to be a place for God to reside in. In fact, when he created man, that's what it was all about. It was all about God and man being one. And that's what the temple is all about. Because the temple is the place where man has an encounter with God, where God and man become one in the temple, where they communicate, where they talk. And I don't know if a lot of you know this or not, but the temple is called the navel. It's where, 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 where the kingdom is birthed. It's birthed from the temple. It's the navel. I find it very interesting. Um, I was talking to Dave about this. Uh, not to Dave. I was talking to uh, Pastor Dell about this, how... The navel represents what you get your life source from. And we get it from the temple. We get it from God. We get it from the spirit of God in the temple. And I find it very interesting that in Genesis chapter 3, 15 and thereafter, it says that 
that the serpent was cursed. And he said, on your belly, you will go eating dirt, eating dust all the days of your life. The reason that the navel, that on his belly, really it means the navel, the reason that he's on his belly is because now he will now get sustenance from the dirt because God will no longer provide for him because he's fallen. And now he will get his nutrients and his source from the dirt, from this world. The world will have to provide for him, right? And um, it's very, very, very interesting because when Cain kills Abel, it's the same thing. He tells Abel, uh, he tells Cain that he's cursed and he says that the earth will no longer release her strength to you. That's very interesting. So, guys, I'm hoping that you guys can get something out of this. Really give this some thought. What am I saying in all of this? What I'm saying is that you have the presence of the spirit of the living God living on the inside of you as a temple. And the glory of God fills the temple, right? And you are walking around filled with the presence of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are now the temple. See, people used to go to the temple. Now the temple comes to us. Now the temple goes to people. Now the temple, the spirit of the living God through a vessel goes to people. When Jesus was walking around, he was the temple. He was the new temple. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. Everybody was going to the temple to worship. But yet Jesus was the temple walking around, loving all people, healing people, destroying the works of the devil, doing all the things that God, that God had him do. It was an amazing reality how the temple was walking around manifesting the spirit of the living God. And as the temple, you can do that at any time. At any time, you can manifest the spirit of the living God. And that's what all this is about. And this is what we teach. We teach people how to manifest. See, we don't teach people how to heal the sick. We teach people to commune with God in the temple, allowing the spirit of God to flow like rivers of living water from the temple, the rivers to flow from the temple, right? And that's what all this is about. That's why we started the school. We started the school. And if you want to know more about it, just right here. You can go there. And guys, like I said, this is what our main mission is. Our main mission is to teach people to walk out who Christ is on a daily. God created you to dwell in you. Now, he couldn't dwell in you before because of sin. And that's why Jesus came to separate you from that. And a lot of people don't even know what sin is. They think it's an action, what you do, what you don't do. Sin is a nature. And Jesus didn't come to, come to fix you. He came to kill you and give you a new identity in him. And when you understand that, you can start test driving. What I mean by test driving is you get to actually walk out who you are and get to practice who you are on a daily, opposed to trying to teach the old man how to walk out who you are. Jesus doesn't want him to walk it out. Jesus wants him to die. And that's the reason we started the School of Identity and Lifestyle is because we want to, teach, want to teach people to manifest who they are in Christ, not in the flesh. Because once you start manifesting Christ in the flesh, you're going to start questioning what it is that God is doing because the carnal mind is at enmity against God. It's not subject to the laws of God. Neither can it be, but yet almost every believer I know being trained in their carnal man, in their carnal mind, in their questioning and getting upset and getting frustrated because things are not working and i'm like of course things are not working because the old man was not created to walk out the presence of god the old man was created to submit and die right so god doesn't want to fix you he wants to kill you and i tell people just hurry up and die quietly and allow god to do what he wants to do in your life so guys in the name of jesus be blessed um, I hope you enjoyed this. I tried to get through as fast as I could. I really want to dig in some things, but this is the first one. We want to make sure that you guys got some good substance, um, sustenance and substance out of this. Um, guys, you can go to the site, www.royalfamilyinternational.com. You can go there as well. If people say, hey, Pete, we really enjoyed what you're doing. We want to sew into that. You can go to the donation button and donate on that. If not, you can get the book. This is what we do, guys. We train and we teach and we have people that we're training 
And we have students that we're training all around the world that we're teaching to walk out the kingdom of God because we're supposed to bring the kingdom here on earth. A lot of people trying to leave. I'm not trying to leave. I'm trying to establish God's kingdom here on earth because Jesus is coming and he's coming to reign. Do you want to reign with him or do you want to get out? Our job is to, uh, to make ready for him to come. Why would I want to leave? Why would I want to leave? No. Nah. Nah, I don't want to leave. I want to be here with him, right? With him. Because look, I'm with him now. I'm with him now. Are you with him now? You see, now you'd be like, well, I don't know if I'm with him or not. Well, those who are joined to the Lord are one spirit. So my job is to establish the kingdom so he can come. And it says when all the world is heard, when, when, the, when the gospel has been proclaimed, when the kingdom is proclaimed to all the world, right? And that's our job. We want to make sure that people are walking it out, not just proclaiming it, right? Preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. So guys, I love you guys in the name of Jesus. I hope this blessed your time. Um, it feels a little weird for me because I'm used to having an audience in front of me, but I'm going to keep at it. I'm going to keep going because there's a lot of things I want to talk about. Uh, please listen to it. Go over it. Um, we got the PDF, the files that are loaded up. Download them. Go through them. Share this with a friend if you enjoyed it. If you didn't enjoy it, I'll do better next time. There's always a next time, right? Because we're all growing and we're all learning. And as long as we got the word of God, we got more, we got more to get into. So guys, I love you guys in the name of Jesus. Um, yeah. So Jesus is the star. I'm just tight, man. And I love you guys in the name of Jesus. And we're going to call that a wrap. So guys, I love you. Thank you for attending with the coronavirus, everything that's going on. Um, this allows us to reach into your home and to teach you and bring the realities of God king, God's kingdom to you. And I just want to thank you for taking time aside. I'm so humbled that you would even listen to what I have to say. Because, man, God will take you in places you never thought you'd go if you just humble out and listen. So, guys, I love you guys. Uh, thank you, Trey. Thank you, um, Dave. Thank you, Linda Martin, for all the guys that are working while I'm doing this. This is not a one-man show, man. This is a lot of people working hard to bring you what it is that God wants to give you through the school and through the site and through their hard work. Thank you guys. They were up till two in the morning getting things done. Dave was up early this morning just to make sure that you guys get what it is that God wants to give you. And I just want to honor them and I want to honor you. So guys, in the name of Jesus, thank you. And I hope to see you guys soon, right? So be blessed, be blessed, be blessed.